Hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to see such a huge turnout here. We had over 600 people register, and we have um, over 200 people on the line right now. A lot of folks registered um, who are not in this time zone and are going to wait for the recording, um, but I'm pleased um, to have you guys here. So if you're joining a Coral Restoration Consortium webinar for the first time, welcome. I'm Tali Vardy. I'm the executive director of the CRC, and we are the community of practice for reef restoration and intervention. This is a tough time to be in this business. I wish the reefs didn't need us. And I wish we didn't have to restore reefs at all, let alone see corals we grow and outplant um, die. Um, but we have to remember that we knew there would be another global bleaching event. Um, and in fact, bleaching is one of the primary reasons that huge investments have been made in the infrastructure to conduct coral intervention. This is the climate reality that we live in. We're not naive. We know that coral restoration cannot keep pace with current levels and predictions of ocean warming. Greenhouse gas emissions must be slowed, stopped, and reversed. And current efforts are a fraction of what they need to be. However, in the meantime, we as a community work to keep as much diverse coral genetic material out on the reefs as we can. And we're here to discuss how to do that. So a few logistics as we get started. Please ask questions in the chat. Michelle Lowe, uh, CRC's product coordinator, will monitor the chat and choose one question for speaker. If we don't get to your question, do not worry. We will collect questions and send out answers within a couple of weeks. The speakers have been asked to respond to your questions in the chat as well, so hopefully that will work. And besides the speakers, we have several experts on the line who will help answer questions and participate in the discussion. Thank you one and all for joining as panelists and speakers. Um, the panelists who are not speakers are Jennifer Moore from NOAA, who is leading the Florida Coral Rescue Program right now, Raquel Pachetto from KAUST, who's developing probiotics, Liz Gergen from KAUST, who authored the monitoring guide for coral restoration. She's also solo parenting an infant, so if she's on and off, that's why. Um, Tom Moore from CAUS, the director of the Shusha Island Reef Restoration Initiative, and Alexander Stead, um, who has conducted shading projects in the Maldives. So I'd like to start the webinar now. We have a lot to cover um, by introducing Derek Manzello, um, coordinator of NOAA's Coral Reef, Reef Watch. Um, he will be helping us um, understand how to use coral reef watch products to predict when, where, and how severe bleaching will be in your neck of the woods. So take it away, Derek, or maybe I have to make you the presenter. Um, okay, I think I just did that. Cool, thank you so much, Tally. All right, so can everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Let me just hide that. Hide this so I can see what I'm doing. All right, thank you so much. Um, my name is Derek Manzella. I'm the coordinator of NOAA's Coral Reef Watch. Uh, we're a little bit short on time today, so I'm gonna cut the pleasantries and just kind of dive right in. Um, so if you go to our webpage, coralreefwatch.noaa.gov, it'll pop up and look like this. So I'm going to walk you through the key data products we provide and how to interpret those for your regions of interest. So first, I'm going to focus on our core, near real-time, sea surface temperature-driven data products. So these are useful for answering the question, is my reef currently at risk for bleaching? So at Coral Reef Watch, we develop uh, our own sea surface temperature product. It's called Coral Temp. This blends data from geostationary and polar orbiting satellites to produce a daily global gap-free SST product at a five kilometer by five kilometer resolution. Now for corals, we're particularly interested in thermal anomalies. So we produce an SST anomaly product. This simply shows you how sea surface temperatures around the globe currently compare to conditions on average. Uh, the take home message here is that the majority of the global ocean right now is running hot, hotter than uh, it normally is at this time of the year. And it's particularly hot 
uh, right now in the northern Atlantic. So for corals, we are particularly interested in a thermal anomaly called the coral bleaching hotspot. Now the coral bleaching hotspot represents uh, temperatures above the maximum monthly mean sea surface temperature. What that means simply is the average temperature during the warmest month of the year is your maximum monthly mean sea surface temperature. So the bleaching threshold can be estimated very simply by adding a one degree Celsius to that MMM or maximum monthly mean uh, sea surface temperature. So what that means is when the deviation above that maximum monthly mean SST becomes one degree Celsius or greater, that is when we estimate that corals are gonna start experiencing stress. So this essentially shows you an instantaneous uh, daily interpretation of where corals are currently being stressed in real time. So any yellows or warm around this plot shows you that these corals are uh, experienced stress on August 6, 2023. So any coral hotspots uh, greater than or equal to one degree Celsius get summed over the past 12 weeks. And this yields the degree heating weeks product, which is the primary coral bleaching algorithm that we use to infer heat stress on the world's uh, coral reefs. So any yellows or warmer indicate uh, enough degree heating week accumulation to uh, be where we expect bleaching. Any reds or warmer colors indicate where there's enough heat stress accumulated where we expect mortality to start beginning. So if you do not wanna waste your time learning about degree heating weeks and coral bleaching algorithms, you want a simple product. Um, Gong Lu, senior programmer, coral reef scientist at uh, Coral Reef Watch developed what's called the bleaching alert area. And this simply shows you where on the planet over the past seven days, there has been bleaching level heat stress. So all the reds, light reds, correspond to an alert level one when we expect bleaching to start, and all the dark reds correspond to alert level two for when we expect uh, mortality to be, begin occurring. So we also produce regional virtual stations, and I'll jump into that later. So now I want to introduce you to our Outlook product. If you go back to the main website and click on Outlook, uh, it'll show you uh, various um, iterations of, of, our, of our forecast product. So this will help you answer the question, will my reef be at risk for bleaching soon? So this is produced weekly and goes out uh, four months in advance. And this is model-based and it's based on NOAA's climate forecast system. So here's the current 90% probability coral bleaching outlook product as of last week. And as you can see, it's predicting uh, heat stress to continue and intensify throughout the Carib Caribbean basin uh, less so in the, in the Pacific, um, mainly looking like uh, heat stress is going to be impacting equatorial sites in the Western Pacific and potentially sneaking into the Northwest Hawaiian Islands uh, later in the summer. So now I want to walk you through our virtual stations, and I think these will be most useful for many of the people online. Uh, so if you click on virtual stations, this Google Earth interface will pop up showing you the 214 regional virtual stations that are currently operational uh, around the planet. So today I'm going to focus on our Columbia Atlantic virtual station because this area has been experiencing some uh, unprecedented uh, heat stress, uh, like many locations in, in the Caribbean. So if you click on uh, that Google Earth interface, you can zoom in. And then if you zoom into the Columbia Atlantic and click on the little icon there, this little uh, white box will pop up that shows you the current thermal stress gauge. Uh, as well as the uh, most recent uh, sea surface temperature data, hotspot data, degree heating week data, and anomaly data. So if we first click on the alert gauges in Outlook, this will pop up. So what this is showing you is in the top left, this is showing you the current bleaching alert area product for this regional virtual station. So the regional virtual station is outlined there in those black lines. And again, for simplicity, reds indicate where bleaching is expected based on degree heating with accumulation, and the dark reds where we expect mortality to begin occurring. So in the top left is the current conditions, and then in the top right there is the forecast output for the next four weeks. And then in the bottom left, that's weeks five through eight, and then in the bottom right, that's weeks nine through 12. So essentially what this is showing us is that the heat stress is predicted to persist in this region, and continue to be most severe in the southern regions of the uh, Columbia Atlantic 
virtual station down near the border with Panama. Now, I do want to point out that this defaults to the bleaching alert area product, but if you look at the top there, you can essentially pick any of our products going back throughout the entire satellite record, and it'll generate these data for you. So if I want to know degree heating weeks for this regional virtual station, I can click on that, and this shows me a very nice uh, plot of how the degree heating weeks are playing out in the Columbia Atlantic. Now remember, degree heating weeks are an accumulation of thermal stress over the past 12 weeks. So what this is showing us is that the most extreme thermal stress at this regional virtual station is occurring in the southern portions of it. And if you look at the northeastern quadrant there of this regional virtual station, that location has yet to experience bleaching level uh, heat stress. So if you click on time series graphs and data uh, in that little white icon that pops up, the, the graph here in the top left is going gonna, is gonna to pop up. So what this is showing you is the last two years of data for this regional virtual station. So the dark blue or dark purple line, I don't know how it looks on your screen, is your daily average sea surface temperature for this site. All those little light blue crosses, that, those are the monthly average temperatures for this site or the climatology. This is how temperatures normally uh, are occurring at that time of the year. So your maximum monthly mean sea surface temperature is your climatology or your monthly average during the warmest part of the year. And again, the bleaching threshold is simply one degree Celsius greater than that MMM. So if we click on multi-year, oh, I also wanna point out that this graph also summarizes degree heating weeks on the bottom. It's basically integrating degree heating weeks through time and it's uh, categorized based on color such that when you break that four degree heating week threshold, this is an alert level one. And we can see that this virtual station is currently experiencing an alert level two which is when heat stress gets so severe that we expect mortality to start occurring. Uh, just very quickly, I wanna point out that a bleaching warning is when sea surface temperatures begin to, or excuse me, when they breach or exceed the bleaching threshold. So when you see a bleaching warning pop up, that basically means the corals in that area are thermally stressed, but they have not yet experienced enough thermal stress over time to uh, elicit a alert level one when we expect bleaching to happen. So in this graph on the right, this shows you all the data uh, in the entire satellite record for this site. And you can see that right now, temperatures are running as hot or hotter than they ever have. And the, and the black line shows you degree heating week accumulation on the bottom. And you can see it's hotter right now at this site than it's ever been in the satellite record. So we recently instituted single pixel virtual stations for some key locations. We set up 11 of these in the Florida Keys. And these have been very useful for managers and restoration practitioners to understand how the thermal stress is varying across the Florida reef tract, including the key mission iconic reef sites. So if you click on any of these blue boxes, it'll pop up the, this uh, graph showing you the thermal stress at these various sites. Um, and I do just wanna quickly point out, um, if you click on multi-year graph for Newfound Harbor, which is one of the mission iconic reef sites, you can see the black line showing you the sea surface temperature patterns. You've probably heard in the news, but these skyrocketed to record values uh, in early July, stayed there, dipped recently and have recently popped back up. So this site is currently experiencing about 15 degree heating weeks. And as you can see in that plot, this is literally off the charts for what this site has experienced in the satellite record going back to 1985. We've also set up single pixel virtual stations in the US Virgin Islands with help uh, from the Nature Conservancy, University of the Virgin Islands and National Park Service. Again, I just wanna point out data from Southwest St. Thomas. Um, so this site just began experiencing uh, degree heating week accumulation in the past several days. And I do want to point out very quickly, if you look at the black line in the bottom right for daily average sea surface temperatures, you'll notice that the temperatures are currently running hot, as hot or hotter than they ever have in the satellite record. And the degree heating weeks have begun accumulating earlier than before in the satellite record. Unfortunately, this pattern is currently playing out throughout the Caribbean as most of our regional virtual stations are showing that sea surface temperatures are as hot or hotter than they've ever been in the satellite record. And we're seeing the accumulation of thermal stress earlier than has ever occurred in the satellite record. So in summary, we're currently experiencing a large scale event. I wanna point out that this started in the Eastern Tropical Pacific uh, back in May and June. Uh, we currently have confirmed bleaching reports from five countries in the Eastern Pacific. So Panama, Colombia, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Mexico and at least six countries in the Caribbean. 
So both sides of the Yucatan and Mexico, Belize, uh, the Caribbean side of Panama, Cuba, Florida, and the Bahamas. So we have a very large scale bleaching event unfolding. And as I said, the entire Caribbean Sea is currently much hotter than normal. So unless there's some significant changes in weather patterns or hurricane activity starts spinning up, we are currently on track and marching towards a Caribbean wide bleaching event. I'd like to thank the team, Gong Liu, Jackie Delacour, Eric Geiger, William Skirving, Blake Spady, and Andrew Nori, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Derek. It's incredible um, how you guys take data from the sky and create a crystal ball. And I really think there's no excuse anymore to be caught off guard um, considering those Outlook products. Oops. Um, and I, I just think we have to make the best use out of the data that we have. Um, so thank you, you guys. It's a real treat to get um, the <laughs> Coral Reef Watch um, 10 minute version from Derek himself. I actually went to the Coral Reef Watch website and tried to do this myself. And um, I gotta say, I learned a lot in just five minutes on the website. There's amazing tutorials. If Derek spoke a little fast for you, everything he said is literally on the website. Um, oh, sorry. Um, okay, I'm trying to multitask here, that's not working. Um, Michelle, can you make me the presenter? I don't know why. I can't find my name. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes, okay, great. So next we have um, from the scene of the crime, uh, Jessica Levy director of restoration strategy at the coral restoration foundation um so take it away jess thanks tally you can go uh, ahead and just okay great flip to the next side you can hear me okay i can hear you just great um all right so i've broken up this content into uh two things one how we have prepared for events like this and by prepared i mean both how we've structured our program as well as what we do seasonally and then we'll wrap with um some lessons learned and potential directions that we're going like T tally and derek were saying uh it's very much still an active situation so don't have all the answers for everyone just yet um tally you can go ahead and go to the next please but in terms of how we have prepared, there's really been two ways to think about this. There's how you build out and structure a restoration program from the onset, um, understanding that this is our unfortunate reality. Um, and then of course, there's what we do seasonally. So in terms of how we have built up our program to anticipate events like this and to give us the best chance of success, it's really been about reducing our risk and reducing our uh, potential of a complete like and catastrophic loss. Um, so our program has been built to maintain an abundance of coral stock. Uh, within that stock, we promote an immense amount of genetic diversity across the species that we work with that are raised in our nurseries. Those corals are located in multiple locations. We have established multiple genetic banks. Um, again, these are in distinct geographic locations, which helps spread our risk through events like this and then a huge part has been to use intuition and to anticipate events um, a great example of this has been if you see in our social media the use of what we call the coral bus um, that bus just didn't pop up a week ago it was something that we knew we needed a year and a half ago we worked with noaa and the national marine sanctuary foundation to fund it um, it took a year to build and I'm really grateful that we pushed and anticipated the need for a tool like that because we knew we would need to be able to move corals in extreme um, summer temperatures. Next slide, please. So in contrast to how we've just simply designed the program for, from the ground up through the years, there's what we do seasonally, and that's activities like lowering nursery structures, through this event, we've actually lowered them even further than we would normally do by almost attaching them directly to the duckbill themselves. 
uh, we try to make sure we go into summer season with a reduced coral stock by outplanting. Um, this year, we did that up into a certain point and then suspended our outplanting efforts because it was getting too uh, stressful. Summer is always a stressful time for us in the Keys, um, like in many places. So we also increase our monitoring and our disease removal efforts when it comes to this season. And then um, if you have temperature loggers within your nurseries, which is definitely highly recommended, but one of the things that's really helpful is to plan to pull them more frequently um, so that you can start to see real time what your temperatures in the water are doing as well. Um, thanks, Tally. So that's how we've prepared going into this. However, there's only so much you can do, particularly with something this unprecedented and an event of this significance. Um, it's kind of like looking at a Cat 5 direct hit as well. There's only so much you can do to prep. Um, fortunately, using a lot of that predictive technology that Derek was just talking about, we did understand that something was coming earlier this year. Um, the managers of Florida, as well as the restoration practitioners, got together and started to put a plan in place. Uh, the first step of that was a genetic preservation effort. Um, and then a second has been one that I'll talk a little bit more detailed on where the CRF has taken on after that. Tally, if you can go to the next. Um, this rescue effort has come in two stages This for us. The first has been this genetic preservation effort. Um, this has been a NOAA-led effort with all the restoration practitioners in South Florida, as well as several other ex situ facilities and aquarium facilities. Um, and agencies coming on to help us out. We've relocated so far nearly 400 different genotypes of just staghorn and elkhorn corals to two ex situ facilities being Moat based in Sarasota and then the Reef Institute, which is based uh, in West Palm. So getting them out of the Keys completely. We have Jen Moore on the call as a panelist. So she's around to answer a lot more details. So I won't go into this anymore, but the intent of this was to Basically, in the event of a complete and catastrophic loss, we at least have all the genotypes and the genetic material that's left in the Keys safeguarded in land-based facilities as well. Next, please, Tally. Um, so with that effort having kind of been uh, quote unquote completed, um, CRF moved on to an effort to basically um, preserve our stock. So now we're looking at an event that is unprecedented. It's going to continue. Um, we have corals that are doing fine now, but the question is how much longer this is going to last and to what extent and what's going to happen to the stock during those events or as this continues. So we've continued our co collaborations with ex situ facilities. We've now moved corals into also Keys Marine Lab and Seabase. We're currently working to relocate uh, numerous corals of low or what we call at-risk stock from our nurseries. Um, we're prioritizing moving corals from our southern nurseries first. Uh, we've moved about 4,000 corals to date into these additional ex situ holding opportunities, and we're targeting about 10 to 20 corals per species per genet. And the intent here is to once this event is subsided and we start talking about rebuilding, the intent is to ensure that we have the material safeguarded to immediately put back into the nurseries, frag out, and start to uh, restart a program if need be. Um, next slide, please, Tally. And then just to kind of wrap up, there are some next steps in discussion. There's discussion of potentially moving corals into deeper waters, a lot of trade-offs here. Um, the addition of adding shading to our nursery structures. We could expand our ex situ nursery holding efforts and partnerships and collaborations. Again, some trade offs there. Um, continuing to monitor both on the reef and the nursery. This helps us to understand performance of these corals. Um, and then, of course, we'll have conversations of how to rebuild after this event subsides. Um, to date, some lessons learned. Again, actively changing situations. So we're going to learn a lot more in the months to come um, but collaboration has been key this is not just within the restoration community which has been fantastic but also just the keys community in general has really stepped up um, the this proactive approach that we've taken to risk management and having a lot of geographic redundancy has been essential um, 
the next big thing has just been able to make a decision and move forward. Um, essentially, like you have to just make a decision with information at hand. As things change, make a new choice and move on. You have to make progress. And then the way Tally started this is exactly correct. Climate action is a must. If anything, we're hopeful that this is something, an event that launches some change after this, because it's really what is ne a necessity. Coral restoration is a part of the solution. It's not the solution. So we're really hoping that this catalyzes something in the wake of an event like this. Um, and I think that is the last I have for you all. Um, Tally, please go ahead and take it back. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, if there are questions, please put them in the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. We don't have time for questions now, but Michelle will be collating them and getting your questions answered afterwards. Um, so I'm going to move right on to Dr. Austin Bowden Kirby from Corals for Conservation in Fiji, and he's going to be talking about some bleaching interventions that he's done in on the opposite side of the world. And thank you so much, Austin, for being awake at 1.30 a.m. Uh, good, good, <clears throat> good morning or whatever it is over there. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so, you know, I, I did a lot of work in, in Puerto Rico, Jamaica, um, Belize, Honduras, and um, Re Dominican Republic, and with, with the Crawfords. And I work with mostly acropids here in in the Pacific. Um, we've already had a collapse of the coral fauna of Kiribati. Um, it straddles the equator, and they had much worse conditions than than or as bad as what's happening in Florida, but for a very long period of time, um, for for ten months uh, to eleven months. And you guys are going to be in distress for less than that, which. I mean, and, and believe it or not, there was a little bit left after that. So um, I really feel for the people going through the loss of so much. I mean, you feel like crying, you're gonna be crying. Um, and it happened to, to us in Fiji. So if you look in this map of Fiji, the star on the Eastern side of our main island, Bitilebo. Bitilebo is bigger than Puerto Rico. So, um, that actually Fiji Fiji is about twice the size of Puerto Rico in total. But anyway, this this star on the eastern side, this is the cooler side. This is where the trade winds come. And we had a site there, and this is where the BBC TV came in and said, wow, look at what's happening. We had an amazing site there, and it almost all died in the 2014 bleaching. And then in 2016, it started to die again, what, what little bit had left, and then a massive cyclone came. So we have had a lot of experience with bleaching here. We've had four mass bleachings that have resulted in death. The first one was the year 2000, and it resulted in 80% of our corals dying in the southern half of Fiji. And it was really devastating, but it was amazing how fast things came back because we still have coral reproduction going on in areas that, that didn't get so badly affected. We just came out of a mass bleaching, um, and that, that you know it's, it's our winter time now. And um, I woke up the chicken, sorry. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so we just came out of a mass bleaching and um, we had, and, and every bleaching that hits, even though it's more severe, we have fewer deaths. So there is some evidence that there's some adaptation going on, natural adaptation. So everything that does survive is precious and you keep it alive and don't let the predators eat it. And don't, don't only think about snails and fireworms, you have big problems with parrotfish and with butterfly fish, okay? So this is our primary site on the western side of Fiji, which the leeward side, it's normally um, much hotter than the eastern side. And we have a coral population up against the islands here where we have records of 37 degrees centigrade without bleaching on some of the corals, on some of the acropolis. So um, typically every summer it gets in the low 30s, and on a bleaching year, it'll get 34 to 35, and very little bleaches in the in that area. What we're concerned about is the future. We know that if it's getting to 34, 35 now, it won't be that many more years before it's 36, 37, or 38, like Florida Bay. We know that that is an ephemeral coral population if you look over time, and everything that is resistant there will end up dying. 
And so we are looking into the future and we're moving it. We've moved most of the genotypes of the Acropoporas out to the second reef where it gets to 32 now on a warm summer um, afternoon at low tide. And so we have our main gene bank nursery is there on this sec on this middle reef. The, it's a middle barrier reef, nuclear reef. And now we're in the process of moving everything out to the outer cooler reef where it never gets, seems to get above 30, 31 maybe on a bleaching year. So things that are adapted to 34, 35 without bleaching are not going to bleach on that outer bleaching, on, I'm sorry, on the outer reef for decades, maybe forever, um, because sea level's rising as well. And that's also cooling off the near shore waters. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah. So I don't have that many slides, but so in 2019, we had a bleaching come and I had a workshop going on. And I said, how can we do our workshop? It's summertime, we're not supposed to do this. And, and, and so we were fragmenting corals and we, we started experimenting with shade cloth. Now, our, this is our typical nursery. It's a table nursery. It has ropes under that table. And normally we'll have cookies and so forth. But the rope sections, are, our nurseries are ideal for shading. So this is the type of nursery that Lisa in Belize, the Fragments of Hope is using. Um, Punta Cana um, Foundation in Dominican Republic is also using this, I introduced there, um, and, and so forth. So this type of nursery is, it's like ready for your, for your bleaching. Uh, so, so we put this, go ahead to the next slide. So what we do is we take shade cloth and basically the shade cloth, if you look at this, the drape on the, it's draped over, it's, it's interesting because it's just the right width. It comes in the right, right width by double. It comes double the width. So we left it doubled over. We could only get 30% shade cloth. So this is 60% shade. And one part's a little bit messed up on one side. But we basically have a metal bar sewn into each end, and it's draped over. And we like that drape. You know, it's, it's a heavy metal bar. It's weighing it down. We don't have to tie it on. We're hoping a cyclone doesn't come in this sense, but um, if a cyclone comes, it might blow it away. We might have to tie it in and so forth. And I don't know if it'll stand in a cyclone, but those corals that we fragmented for the workshop, absolutely zero bleaching. Okay, so if you're moving corals, remember, and this is what we found, if you move an entire colony, it maintains its upright position for all those branches and they're all self-shading. And that's not such a stress if you move an entire colony. But like if it's on a structure or whatever, or if you've moved it from the wild. But if you remove, if you move something and break it into a fragment, it's going to reorient, and then it's going to get really badly stressed because this is also the high UV time of year. So you really have to shade if you're going to do any coral work in the summer because the high UV. Now we now we say well, if you have to do coral work, we shade it if we're fragmenting. Okay. So go to the next one, and it just shows some words on the same picture. So the middle metal rebar is on both ends. We don't even have it attached, but we have it heavily draped over um, so that that shade, because it's a very sandy area and lots of reflection coming in. And um, so if you can find 50% shade cloth, that you might not have to double it over. And doubling over, it kind of can catch the current more. So it's better to have it. You can get 50% shade. I don't know if you can. And so we have doubled over this 30%. So we do get sediment or algae, you know, diatoms or something done in flight, something on the on the shade. So we took a brush and we just brushed it off every week. Okay, next one. And uh oh, that's it. Okay, what? So they cut off all my slides. Oh well. Okay, so so um, no, what we, there, there were several slides in there that were skipped. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so we also in in our Motoriki site site where they had the mass death and die off, we just had a mass bleaching, and we've got the community collecting coral. So when you have a hundred percent bleaching, it's all bleached. Everything is a hundred percent bleached on the surface, and most of them, the little color charts don't work very well here for us because you can have a hundred percent bleaching, and then if you look underneath, yeah, there's some good color there. So how are you going to? I mean, how do you? You call that if you take a photo from the top, it looks 100% bleached. But if you were to take a, you know, if you go sideways, you'll see that it's not 100% bleached. So um, we're having a problem using that chart, that little color thing. So 
but what we did is when the water cools off, you have over a month where the corals don't recover, but the water is cooler. And that's the time when we actually start collecting unbleached corals because we still have masses of corals here. We're, and if we try to tag them, we're never going to find our tags. So one out of 10,000 corals not bleached. Okay. And what we do is we go in and we actually collect them. We actually went and we collected with the community. We have set up, we set up our own new nurseries. And, um, and this is the only way we can move forward is actually to use the bleaching event as a, a, an, a, as a selection event to get what we need for moving things forward. So um, we don't have any money. We just have the community. They do it for free. And we created an entire new nursery of super bleaching, uh, bleaching resistant corals. And now we're ready to start propagating those corals for the community-based no fishing areas. So the community is very excited about it and they saw the bleaching. They know that a lot of those corals are dying. And so, um, so we're using them, but we are, we're there helping. It's not a free for all, we're there supervising. And so um, this is an opportunity as well as a test. And if you're going to survive into the next decade and two and three decades, the only way to do this is to make sure that what doesn't bleach is actually actually survives. And so that translocation of corals from your hottest reefs out is probably it's a proactive thing. So never mind, it's not bleaching. We need to start moving corals from our hotter waters to our cooler waters proactively. OK, set. Austin, thank you so much. Your experience was invaluable. Um, and a lot of what you said, I incorporated into the monitoring protocols that I'll be covering um, a little bit later. So thank you so much. We're, we're just about five minutes behind, but I think I can make it up when I do um, my talk. So I just want to introduce David Mead and Neil Canton from the Australian Institute of Marine Science and the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program in Australia. They're going to be talking about some methods that they've trialed um, and reviewing their results. So please unmute Neil or David, whoever is going first. Yep. Go for it, Sally. Next slide, please. Hi, everybody. I'm David. I'll start and then Neil and then come back to me. So next slide. Yeah, next slide. So in the inside the rest, oop, ah, you know, <laughs> this will be slightly interesting. Um, back a slide, because <laughs> that's not one of ours. Um, <laughs> so uh, inside, yeah, that's the right slide, but I don't think the next one was one of ours. That might have been one of Austin's. Um, yeah. So anyway, we'll work no, through this. So I look, I stuck that in there for Neil. So Neil, Neil will cover that hopefully. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so inside of inside of RAP and AIMS, we've been exploring a bunch of methods. Um, this is a summary of them. I've created a table here just to um, indicate which ones might be suitable for use now. Um, obviously, there's a lot of conversation about shade cloth and things like that. Neil will cover off what we find is required. So you've got a target. Um, we've looked at things like micro bubbles and surface films. I wouldn't be recommending those. Um, you can get the level of shading, but retaining them in the right location proved to be problematic. I'll talk briefly about fogging and where that's at. Um, cloud brightening is another method we're working on, but it's not ready. It's a way away. Um, and a few comments on thermocline mixing and cold water injection um, for people that are interested in exploring those types of options. So next slide and I'll hand over to Neil. Thanks, David. Thanks, Tally. Thanks everyone for having us today. So there's, we're gonna start the talk on this section with a few examples. Austin already showed one, but there's a few different groups using different structures to provide shade cloth for their um, nursery grounds and their fragments, which are important. Um, and I think thinking through the engineering, where you're placing your structures, how much water movement, how much wave energy you're going to be hitting these structures is really important as you design and engineer your shade structures for your nursery um, fragmentation setups. Next slide. So there's a few just quick examples. 
um, from around the world, different programs and the yellow fiberglass. We've started using those in Australia for the experiment that we ran at Lizard Island a couple of years ago, and it worked quite well in pretty high wave energy environments. Um, it is very labor intensive to put small three by three meter, three, but three by three foot type structures. So it is very labor intensive and you're not going to cover a big reef area with these sorts of structures. I think it's more designed for the nursery grounds than anything else. Next slide. So Austin showed you examples of the shading. Um, in terms of the physiology that's going on between the coral and the symbiote, corals are just like plants. They have the ability to fairly quickly adapt um, the way that symbiote photosynthesizes to optimize the light intensity required for photosynthesis. And this will change if you're moving corals from one depth to, the, to another, it'll change with season, as you can see. And site-specific local light exposure will be re also really important as you think through shading for your projects and programs. So we've, for this project at Lizard, we've been, we have an ongoing light monitoring program where we're monitoring the incoming irradiance to the, to the ocean at Lizard which you can see as the top black and red lines, that's the incoming surface light intensity. And then we also have light measurements um, through time in shallow reef habitats at three and five meters, and then in deeper um, slope locations. And you can see the differences in the seasonal and daily light intensities that these corals are exposed to. And that's gonna really help us guide what shading is required for the corals. Next slide. So linking those field-based observations of light intensity on the reef, we conducted incubations to measure the oxygen and the photosynthetic productivity of the corals across that reef slope um, to determine what is the minimum light intensity that saturates photosynthesis. When the corals under heat stress are saturated by light, the combination of light and heat are causing the stress that leads to bleaching. Um, and from these experiments, we're seeing that about 22% light reduction is the minimum that's required to prevent saturating light intensity for both the shallow and the deep corals. That's the average. There is variation among the population. Some of them are lower. Some of them you can see there is 13% shade was enough to prevent saturating light intensity, but some of the corals were as high as 60% light reductions. But on average, we're talking 20 to 30% shade will prevent um, saturating intensities that will compound the heat stress during a heat wave. Next slide. So for this project, we deployed 30 and 50% shade cloth frames on the reef as a heat wave was starting to build at Lizard Island. Um, we deployed these shade frames at three degree heating weeks and the heat stress during this event built to just below five degree heating weeks. The cyclone actually spun up and um, dissipated the heat stress. So it could have become worse. We were on that edge between three and five degree heating weeks. Um, we monitored bleaching severity under the shade structures among the community of shaded and unshaded individuals. And we tracked recovery of the individuals and we looked at the recovery responses between the shaded and unshaded individuals. We, as you can see from the results here, we're seeing that 30% shade is enhancing the recovery as well as the enzymes related to antioxidant um, dissipation and the ability of the corals to fight bleaching stress. So 30% shade also had a significant effect on the recovery during the event. Uh, next slide, Telly. So that was our field-based trials. Um, again, quite labor intensive and covering small areas with a big team of about 12 to 15 people. Um, We've also been running um, among within the group aquarium-based experiments, testing what levels of shade is required to dissipate heat stress. 
these experiments are starting to show that that 30% target of light reduction is effective, but only at moderate levels of heat stress between the four to six degree heating week level. When you get above that um, heat stress, the light reduction no longer has a benefit. Um, and applying shade at both 15 and 30%. Some of the experiments we've been running, um, we've been testing whether shade all through the summer or through the experiment is important or whether we just do them for short periods while heat stress is, is kicking in. Um, and shading is improving the health, but again, only at moderate levels of heat stress. Next slide. So high levels of shade has been shown to help reduce um, the stress in corals. Um, 30 and 50% shade cloth has been quite effective at excessive degree heating weeks, anything above six degree heating weeks, um, the benefits provided by 30% shade start to disappear and the heat stress alone is still causing bleaching. So you'll wanna be shading your corals early before they start bleaching and before the heat stress really gets extreme. Next slide. In terms of when should you be shading um, corals, direct shade during the middle of the day is most important when that light exposure is saturating the photosystem. So between 10 and three o'clock when solar noon is peaking is important. Shade to offset the heat stress is also most important, important during calm periods, less than 10 knot winds to keep summer temperatures below. Um, and then shading needs to be deployed early. And by early, we again are talking early in the heat wave. So it might be too late um, for a lot of the areas in Florida if you're above six degree heating weeks. Um, and then again, start considering the engineering required for these shade structures on your um, nursery infrastructures. Um, and then again, it's small scale and labor intensive. So these structures do need cleaning multiple times a week to keep the, um, the algal and the disease potential at a minimum. Next slide and handing back to David. Thanks. Um, so one of the other, one of the methods that we've been working on is, is fogging. Um, you can buy industrial fogging machines where, so you can go and buy them. We're using those that are designed for commercial water vapor dust suppression, converting them to salt water. We started, um, we're using, there's a, a name on there. We started with a commercial system. We're kind of customizing that. Um, if people are thinking about trying to do this sort of thing in the current bleaching of everything, I think order times will be your limit. Um, and with these, um, you can pretty much get that percentages that Neil's talking about. So we're starting to sort of see, you know, 30% light reduction um, from these methods over sort of larger scales. It is quite industrial. Um, people are interested in this sort of stuff, then make contact and we can provide you more details. Um, you, you will need to um, mount it on something that moves, so a barge or something that moves so that you can, because your wind direction is changing. Um, and the only, the final caveat I'd say on this is I'm not gonna sit here and guarantee this will work, is that we're, we're probably six months away from knowing a more definitive answer because we're still mid these tests of whether or not you need to do this on every day or the non-windy days. We think that it's just the non-windy days when it's calmer, there's enough light refraction from the waves that is occurring on the windier days to provide that sort of that light, the photon reduction benefit that you're after. Um, it was something like fogging machines when it's windy, of course, the fog simply runs as a, as a straight line too much. And so you're not covering the area that you're after. Um, so this is off the shelf commercial technology, does need a bit of tweaking for use in the marine environment, could be set up reasonably quickly, but you're still talking probably months, right, to, to do this sort of stuff. And it's not 100% certain yet because of that reason. Next slide, I'll just make up a bit of time here. Um, okay, cold water injection. Um, so look, 
Um, this is look where you're where you're trying to move water from an adjacent deeper location where the temperature is cooling and allowing it to mix with the temperature at the target location to reduce the temperature. I have to say, sitting in here, I've yet to see any maths where this method works. Um, albeit we've been focusing on larger areas. Probably a warning to people. There's lots of I call them ambit claims. Um, do some maths before you spend your money if you're thinking about this. If you have sites that have a high residency time, i.e. low currents, um, so that you're not trying to cool the ocean, <laughs> um, you're only trying to cool the water in a, in a particular area, um, and you've got adjacent cold water, then it, then it probably would work at a nursery scale. Um, and there's a report, I've put the link in there, that has a bunch of maths and things like that, that how we've been analyzing these. Um, so you could do some basic calculations and energy consumption things and things like that if you're interested in cold water injection. Uh, next slide, Tali. Similarly, the other kind of, oh, back. Um, the other, one back. The other, the other method that has, <laughs> okay, the so next slide. <laughs> That one, thank you. The uh, other method is mixing thermoclines. So in in lakes, um, people are interested in destratifying them, and so there's a couple of methods that exist to try and remove stratification in lakes that people have been talking about applying into the ocean. So one of them is that you pump compressed air out to the bottom of the out to the area, and as the bubbles rise, they cause the water to flow, and it causes mixing. And another one shown in the diagram there, where you use these sort of soft made of some sort of flexible material ducts with a big fan in them that moves water up and down. And these are quite efficient. They don't need a lot of power to run. Um, again, I've only seen one technical case for reef application in a specific location. And while the proponents argued it would work, our conclusion was that it, that it wouldn't. Um, again, if you're thinking about this sort of stuff, I'd give me a phone call first, but um, high residency times, you need a reasonable thermocline in the area. And of course, you only want corals at the surface because if the area that you're working, you've got corals down deep as well, you will be warming that deeper water. And so you'll be, you might reduce the stress on those at the surface, but you'll increase them, those that are deeper down. And the final slide, thanks Tali, was just a list of contacts that people will get if they wanted to um, follow up on any of these things um, for further information. Thank you. Thank you so much, David and Neil. It's great to see some of the science and um, the trials that you guys have done. Um, even if they haven't come up with solutions, at least we might be preventing people from uh, reinventing the wheel. Um, and so the, that's effort not wasted for sure. So we are back on schedule, which is great. Um, and I am going to be presenting next on documenting loss and finding resilient corals. This is based on some guidance that we put out um, a couple of weeks ago. We really just wanted to kind of get the word out there on the minimum things that folks should be doing. Um, if you're sitting pretty like um, Hawaii is right now here on the lower left, um, you actually have some time to develop a regional rescue plan, which is what you should be doing. Um, in addition to a lot of the other things that people have already said, like developing the engineering for um, shading um, and uh, checking when the bleaching is going to hit your area. Um, on the flip side, if you're already experiencing mass bleaching, you should be stopping any restoration activities and really pivoting to protecting um, and rescuing your corals. Um, and overall, I just wanted to give some guidance on monitoring uh, uh, in this in this time. So there's kind of three levels that we put out basic um, uh, to advanced and I'll just go through them really quickly here. The goal is to document loss and find resilient corals as Austin was saying and I just want to spend a minute on documenting loss here um, because there the UN COP is really focused on quantifying losses and damages for least developed countries right now. And if we are able to quantify loss, there might be an opportunity 
be this year to actually turn that into some financial mechanisms to restore reefs. And we're seeing some examples of that um, in places like Puerto Rico um, through US uh, federal emergency management, but that, that could be happening on a grander global scale. So it's really important. And the very least thing that you could do is just get out on the reef and write down what you see um, and do it as consistently as possible. Your nursery sites, your outplanting sites, control reefs, um, take notes, take photos, and be as consistent as possible. And um, we're here to help if you have trouble even figuring out like kind of where to start. Um, we also want to really let you know about the difference between live, pale, bleached, and dead corals. So here's a photo showing a live, a coral that's going through all the stages. Um, in, in one colony. On the left, you see the tissue. Um, in the middle, you see a bleached coral that still has tissue. You can see those polyps. And on the right, you can see that that coral has died and has turf algae growing on it. So it's important to know what you're looking at. And the frequency that you go out on the reef and monitor should be correlated with how severe the bleaching is. So if you know it's months away or if it's mild um, every other week, can be appropriate. Um, it's really appropriate to take before pictures if you're able to set up a photo mosaic. Um, uh, um, station if you can. Um, and, um, and if this bleaching is severe, you really should be going out daily if possible and at a minimum um, once per week if you don't have that kind of capacity. And we're very aware that places have limited capacity um, and infrastructure sometimes to conduct this monitoring. Um, and you'll want to do this throughout the bleaching event. Um, in addition to, mon to monitoring the loss that's occurring, you want to find and protect resilient colonies. This is really what Austin was just saying, um, but in um, with a little bit of text. So if you have a large bleaching event, you want to go and search for those um, unbleached colonies over the next four to six weeks, collect them, move them to shade or land-based aquaria. And for the remaining corals that are out there, you do have to monitor for predators or else what you have left will also be gone. So one step above the basic monitoring is to do um, more quantitative monitoring, installing temperature loggers, as Jess pointed out, and surveying quantitatively. If you already have a monitoring program, keep doing that. If you don't, we have a restoration monitoring guide on our website that is very comprehensive that has a lot of suggestions, photo quadrats, photo mosaic, line intercept transects, any method that you have, you just keep doing it so you can kind of quantify what's going on um, and adding in observations of other bleached organisms like uh, soft corals, anemones. Um, and if you don't have time or access to camera, just recording the percent of colonies that are bleached um, is also really useful. Um, in addition, if you do have the capacity, taking photos with a color watch chart can be really useful. Um, you have to, there are certain ways that you have to do that. You have to make sure your uh, camera is white balanced. You have to put the chart right next to the colony that you're measuring. We'll have more details when we send this out afterwards. Um, but the goal here really is to, um, if you have the capacity, be a little bit more quantitative about what you're seeing. Um, and again, when the bleaching subsides, you want to um, collect, map um, what you're looking at, set up permanent monitoring stations if you can, and collect um, metadata on the um, depth and date surveyed and, and all, all of that. And finally, if you have additional capacity, um, the gold standard for reef restoration really is photo mosaics. If you can capture a large swath of the reef, that you're restoring, you'll really be able to see how that reef changes over time. This doesn't have to take a ton of infrastructure. We have a webinar on our um, website describing how to do this with something as simple as a GoPro um, or even just kind of a regular point and shoot 
Um, it does take some time on the computer afterwards, but again, this is really the best way to monitor for reef restoration. Um, also in the Caribbean right now, it's spawning season, and there have been some reports of spawning um, on cor corals that are bleached and still spawning. So checking for that um, and noting those results is um, another thing that you can do if you have the bandwidth. Um, collecting sperm and cryopreserving it for future generations would be the ultimate way to preserve that genetic diversity. And um, next, we're going to hear from Ileana Bombs about sampling for genetic identification and preservation. So I'm going to go straight to Ileana, and then um, we might have some time to take some questions for the last few speakers. Hello, everyone. Uh, Emiliana Bombs, and together with Lena Bay, who's also here on the panel, we would like to give you some advice for sampling uh, gen for genetic preservation. Some of the key insights we can gain from such samples is why or documenting why some of these corals are bleaching resistant and some bleach. So oftentimes you see a reef where there is major bleaching, lots of corals are white, but some of them still retain their simoyons and they still have color. And so sampling these bleached and unbleached corals and preserving material for genetic analysis allows us to see whether these bleaching resistant corals may be a certain kind of coral species or a certain kind of coral genotype and if the symbionts that live in that coral perhaps have a certain genetic identity, there are different species of symbiont perhaps that can um, refer some resistance to the higher temperature to that coral. The prokaryotic community may also be at play here. So the genetics can help us to some extent answer the question why we see such variation in bleaching response. Now, the environment that particular coral and its symbiont grow in does matter, which is why we certainly have to record, along with the genetic sample, the location the sample was taken, the, the colony the, that the sample was taken from, the depth, the temperature. So the um, environmental metadata is important to record along with that genetic sample to give the right context. Next slide, please. The way to survey for bleached and unbleached um, corals, uh, Lena, um, Tali has just mentioned, and there is a guide that you can refer to help you design such a survey. And importantly, it will be great to do another survey for recovery in a year or so when hopefully this bleaching event has subsided. Next slide. So the meat of this is that you want to sample bleached and unbleached corals by removing a little bit of tissue. This can be as little as three to 10 polyps or say one centimeter square of tissue. You want to sample in as many, as many as you can in each of the categories, so bleached and unbleached, at several sites, if that's within your possibility. And then you want to note the level of bleaching by taking a photo with a color standard of that particular sampled colony. You would want to record the metadata I just mentioned, so the time and date coordinates and depth uh, of the colony you've sampled. And you want to tag that colony because it's a bit of a money investment and it would be great if you can relocate that coral afterwards and use it in future restoration activities. You want to place the sample in a tube with preservative. There are several different kinds of preservatives you can use. 95% non-denatured ethanol is an easy preservative. There's also commercial products such as RNA later or RNA DNA shield. You can also stick the sample straight into a minus 80 degree freezer without adding any further preservative. Whatever you do, it's always important to keep the amount of seawater that comes with the sample into the tube at a minimum. And we usually change preservatives uh, after 24 hours, at least for ethanol and RNA later. 
once you have the sample recorded and preserved, again, you if you can, resurvey for recovery mortality and record, and then submit your uh, samples for analysis. Next slide. Depending on the coral species you have collected samples for, you have different options on how to get them analyzed. For the acroporates, there is a, a commercial off-the-shelf product available that allows you to send your samples to a company. They will do the DNA extraction for you, run the sample, and give you the data back that then can be analyzed in a standardized workflow, which does not require any kind of computer resources on your part or coding skills, bioinformatics skills, or even uh, genetic knowledge to get that data analyzed. This kind of standardized solution is under development for other taxa, for example, for the Orbicella, but there's also other taxa that are un under consideration. If a standard solution is not available for you, there are non-standardized solutions that are well within the capabilities of the many marine um, genetic laboratories around the world, and so in that case, it would be best to partner with someone who has the bioinformatics know-how to help you and the molecular genetics lab to help you analyze your samples. Even if you don't yet know how you will be analyzing your samples, they will keep, the preservatives will keep your samples and you can worry about the specifics of analysis later. What's important now is to do your surveys and collect the samples so we can figure out what to do with them. Here, in case of the coral snip ship for the acroporates, you can then upload your data into a website. You hit a button, it will execute a workflow and will give you an answer of how many genotypes are in your sample. If that genotype has ever been observed before, you can calculate the genetic relatedness between the samples and it will analyze the major symbiont genera in that sample. And next slide. And there's there's all their step-by-step work uh, tools and protocols for you to um, to refer to. So what kind of insights can we gain from this kind of sampling? Uh, one, even with a small number of samples, we you can get an idea of the genetic diversity in your stock. So the, for example, we can calculate how many clones we have in the nurseries or on the reef, how closely related they are, are they full siblings, are they cousins? And we can identify reefs that have particularly high amounts of genetic diversity. With larger sample sizes, these may yield answers or may yield biomarkers for heat stress in the future. This is certainly a much more advanced analysis and will require collaboration with um, a molecular genetics lab. Next slide. The other insights from this type of data is that they can guide breeding and fragmentation work in your nursery. You can use it to balance the genetic diversity of the stock. You can prevent inbreeding if you're doing sexual reproduction. It allows you to increase the number of genotypes and make sure that you have a good representation of the genotypes in your uh, nursery, both onshore and in the water, as well as um, when you're doing outplanting and it allows you to discover cryptic species. So the rescue mission that uh, Jesse was talking about earlier in Florida was uh, built to a large extent on the fact that we had already genotyped um, most of the wild coral uh, genets that we know of exist in the Florida Keys, and that really allows this rescue mission to be effective in preserving the existing genetic diversity. So finally, you can pre breed and propagate for heat resistance based on the uh, resistant coral colonies that you've been able to identify using the surveys. So not only is the genetic sample important, as I mentioned, you need to have the environmental metadata to go along with it and record that phenotype, so bleached and unbleached. And I believe Steve is gonna talk next about another way of obtaining those kinds of phenotypes, so the physical characteristics of the corals. And lastly, um, the symbiont contribution is important because uh, using genetic tools, we can identify the strains and species in genera that 
may refer this heat tolerance. So one of the known genera that does this in the Caribbean is Duristinium. And we can then locate those colonies and isolate the symbionts from the coral tissue, culture those symbionts, and use them to inoculate young corals during the breeding process. Next slide. So there is a number of protocols available online, but both Lean and I are happy to help answer questions you have should you want to uh, collect genetic samples during this bleaching event. Thank you so much, Ileana. Um, some of you in the Pacific might think, oh, we don't have these problems of low genetic diversity, but after this year, you might. Um, and so I think it's really important to um, just consider um, all this kind of sampling that you might do if you lose a lot of genetic diversity. So it's um, it's kind of sad reality in, in Florida, but um, that same reality might be occurring in other places and restoration infrastructure will be really a critical part of rebuilding um, after this year. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to move straight to Dr. Steve Palumbi and Courtney Klepak from Stanford um, on a tool to test heat resistance in the field. And then if we have time, um, hopefully we'll take one or two questions. Michelle, if you can um, extract them. I know people have been asking a lot of questions. Um, so um, without further ado, um, I think Steve, you're on next. Just unmute, please. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. If you can just go to the the first the first slide there, it's perfect. Um, this just shows what uh, we've been hearing about a little bit earlier. Uh, this is a shot I took in Key Walker in Belize uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're seeing a reasonable amount of bleaching there, just like other places um, in in the Caribbean. The next slide, if you wouldn't mind, Tali. Um, but also, like people have been talking about, we don't see it everywhere. This is West Ternef Atoll in Belize uh, the day, a day later, much less bleaching there. Um, of course, it's a little bit of a different place, but um, we see this all the time. Uh, we've heard it in, in other speakers where places um, where bleaching happens, there's often corals that do not bleach, even when there are corals that, that do. If you wouldn't mind the next slide, Tali. Um, um, the question is why uh, could be the place is different could be the corals are different and how do you how do you tease those apart um austin was talking about this in fiji with places that are inshore and offshore how can you tell that it's the environment that um, is doing that rather than the corals themselves and how can you tell which ones really are bleaching resistant um absolutely next next slide So what we have been doing over the last uh, couple of years and other people around the world as, as well is, is building test units to be able to test corals for their, their heat resistant. These are quite, uh, quite small, they're quite portable, um, and they are built around the idea of, of placing corals within them, stressing them as if it, they were experiencing a very hot day at low tide um, during a bleaching event. Uh, and then monitoring those corals for their bleaching state um, over over time. Um, the key thing that I wanted to emphasize in this talk is the need to be able to do this kind of testing in a lot of different places pretty quickly for a lot of different species in order to not only find out which of the corals are actually heat resistant, be able to monitor them over time. And then as Tali was saying, preparing for the next bleaching event is really important. Um, the corals that survived this bleaching event, are they really heat resistant or are they just lucky? I'm um, in one particular area of the coral. Being able to test them is, is what we want to be able to do. And again, what we've tried to do is, is build a streamlined, inexpensive version of these stress tanks in order to provide the plans and maybe even the tanks to people in lots of different settings to be able to do these tests. Um, I'm in a place where I couldn't really demonstrate the tank uh, quite uh, very well, so I made a hundred second video to do that. Um, it's on YouTube as well. Tali, if you wouldn't mind playing that. The 
current version of our coral stress tank uh, is designed around low cost, high accuracy, and ease of use um, in order to be able to let it be useful for as many different places as possible. Uh, and it also has all of the equipment within it that you need in order to set it up and run it. Uh, the heart of it is one of these electronic chillers that brings the temperature back down and keeps it steady. Uh, the, this fits in the back through a tree dr drilled hole. Then the other side of that, of course, is a regular aquarium heater to bring the water temperature up and keep it steady. Water is moved around within it uh, with a couple of small aquarium pumps. And uh, the whole thing is controlled by this electronic brain uh, made by Inkbird for home brewing uh, that controls the heater and the chiller. Um, this can be set at a single temperature uh, and held like in a control tank, or you can program it in 12 steps to run a particular uh, ramp, for example, up to a particular temperature, hold, and then bring, bring back down. In addition, then we can have a running seawater system that's made of a very simple siphon uh, from, say, a seawater bucket over here, siphoning water into the tank, and then the water comes out there. Uh, altogether, it lets you set this up as, say, a experimental stress tank. Another tank right next to it would be the control tank. Uh, and then you can do whatever kinds of heat stress experiments are appropriate for your species in your place. Thanks. Um, that, that was it. The link to the YouTube is, is on the chat. Um, and um, we're, we're basically here happy to talk to anybody who wants to think about um, building using these tanks um, out there. The parts list is in the next slide. Just to show that we have one, most of this stuff can be ordered on Amazon if you're in a uh, place that Amazon delivers. Um, and other than that, many hardware stores have a lot of this stuff. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn over this over to uh, to Courtney, um, who just took these to Paul Myra Atoll, and she's going to basically show their use out there. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, Tali's next. Yeah, as Steve just said, um, we went last month to Palmyra Atoll to put this system and its utility to the test. Um, as you can see in this image, Palmyra is really far away from any supplier, any store. So kind of like video Steve showed you, we had to bring all of the supplies in those tanks with us and we brought four. Um, next, please. And Palmyra is an atoll that has many different types of reef habitats and they're healthy and they have high coral cover. Next. And although there was widespread bleaching during the 2015-2016 event, next please, there was limited coral mortality and many corals did survive and recover. Um, but what about in the future when we have more marine heat waves, more global bleaching events that are only increasing in frequency and severity? By using these acute heat stress tools, we aim to understand what future reef assemblages might look like. Um, and then for your case, use it as maybe preventative measures, um, proactive interventions to know who your susceptible or tolerant species colonies reefs are um, from these experiments that we are currently doing today. Next. So over the course of about 14 days, we were able to test nine different species across four sites shown in the right side. At Palmyra Atoll, we sampled from one deep four reef, a shallow reef terrace, as well as two shallower lagoon sites. And using only three extension cords and many, many, many buckets of seawater in this outdoor wet lab facility, we were able to conduct three separate multi-species experiments. And if you look in that bottom photo, you can see the tank set up like Steve showed you, as well as the layout of five different coral species within one tank. Each tank can, this kind of tank can hold probably up to about 35 ramets or pieces from a colony. Next, please. And um, we took photographs uh, with color cards every day after the experimental corals experienced one increased degree. And so what that looks like is the first uh, side photos are control or baseline after they were collected. 
and then the photographs were taken after each increase in bleaching experiment temperatures. So 30 after, one day after 34, one day after 35, one day after 36 degrees. And colonies that were completely bleached were removed from the experiment and the bleaching temperatures were recorded. And we are currently working on extracting color values using those color cards. And if you also have the, the Coral Watch health color charts, those can be used as well to extract color values as a proxy for bleaching or color loss. Next. And like I said, we were only there a few weeks ago, but we already have kind of the results to show you guys. Um, and so this is the distribution of bleaching temperatures from all the colonies across all species, across all the sites at Palmyra. And so how this is broken down is the rows represent species or species complexes. If you can't read very well, um, at the top are your branching species or genera, and the bottom are going to be the massives. And each panel represents a site. So the two left panels are our lagoon sites, turtle and quail, followed by the shallow reef terrace, and then the deeper four reef on the right. And the color represents the number, or the distributions represent the number of colonies that bleached at that temperature. So lower bleaching thresholds are those cooler temperatures, higher bleaching thresholds are those warmer orange yellows. So not surprising, um, a cropped species bleached at lower temperatures in comparison to massive species. But what's interesting is that um, if you look at the third row, a, a cropper and a pseudo, we see differences, population level differences, where turtle population bleached at lower temperatures in comparison to quail. So as a practitioner, you might want to, if you want to prevent bleaching, you might want to focus on shading those um, more susceptible populations from turtle. Um, alternatively, you could use the quail population as maybe like your um, stock for your nurseries. Um, we also see differences within species um, by colony. So if you look at Pacillopora, we know there's a lot of variation in bleaching. And so you can also use this tool kind of to pick out which colonies you know, if you have lower diversity, what colonies are more susceptible, what colonies are more tolerant. Um, so this tool is really useful for kind of figuring out what colonies, what species, what reefs might be more or less susceptible to heat stress. Next, please. Um, so I know Palmyra isn't experiencing devastating bleaching like the Florida Keys are. Um, and for those of you on this call that might not be in a place that's experiencing hard bleaching yet, this is another tool to kind of understand what your reef landscape looks like with regards to heat tolerance before natural bleaching occurs. And these tests are easily built and they're commercially available. Um, they can be used in many places like we just showed. And then we, are, we have the parts list and the protocols, and I'm currently working on a website to make all those resources in one location. Um, but we are here to help, so please contact us with any questions or needs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Courtney and Steve. Sorry, my every time I touch my mouse, it seems to go hay, haywire. Um, I'll leave the, the slide on for, for now. Um, so that was our last presentation, and we are um, four minutes from closing, although we've had some offers to stay because we did really want to do a q and I certainly am available. Um, I know um, others may not be. It's also the middle of the night for many people. Um, so um, I did want to at least have time for one or two questions. Michelle, if you have anything ready. Yes, I do. So, Courtney, we have one that just came in for your presentation, so we'll just can do that one quickly. Um, was light tested in the heat stress experiments? Uh, no, so we're trying to focus on heat solely, but you could absolutely build in a setup where you're looking at potential light and heat stress, so kind of more factorial design. And that's what's great about these tanks is I showed you we did it kind of under an overhang because Palmyra was incredibly rainy. Um, so we actually had non-stressful light levels, but if you wanted to incorporate light and see what the additive effects or synergistic effects might be, you could absolutely put these tanks in a more well-lit situation. You could put shade cloth over it. I've worked under canopies before. You can do this anywhere. As long as you have access to power and seawater, they can be put anywhere. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then I have a question that is for all of the panelists. Um, 
This one says University of Florida researcher Dr. Andrew Altereri has found that associated hypoxia poses a more fundamental threat than warming temperatures. Do the panelists agree? Anybody jump in? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the, um, the 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 word more fundamental threat so much, but uh, it is I think undeniable that high temperatures have caused enormous amounts of coral mortality in mass bleaching events, and we know that temperatures will continue to rise, so they're certainly a problem. It doesn't mean that those are that high temperature are the only problem. There is uh, several other concerns. Hypoxia is certainly one of them. Overfishing remains a problem. You know, eutrophication of the of the New York coastal ocean is a problem. So we're certainly battling on many fronts. Yeah, I, I think I Ileana, say... probably what they're getting at is the the hypoxia and low oxygen situations induced by higher temperature um, events that could then either you know cause the mortality as a result of low oxygen environment rather than the temperature environment in that high temperature event well i'll just say that i think part of the problem is that we're not looking at that. So it's really hard for us to be able to say what the relative contribution is, whether it is hypoxia or um, just a, a direct heat stress in some of the places where we've seen um, not just bleaching, but just in like, you know, very quick mortality. Um, we don't have oxygen sensors all over the reef, so we don't really know if it was uh, that or the heat that caused the, the mortality. Okay, I, I just want to take a minute to um, close us out. I think what I'm going to do is um, thank everybody and then also offer for, for folks to stay on for another 30 minutes for questions. Um, and if anybody has to leave, um, that's totally understandable. And if anybody wants to stay on for questions, we're going to, um, the panelists that can will stay on and Michelle will um, filter in some additional questions. Michelle, just give me a nod if that sounds good. Yes, I can stay on for a few minutes. So you may have to look at the questions um, and, and go through some of them. Okay. Um, so I just wanna thank all the panelists and all the attendees. We had um, over 300 people online. Um, an additional 300 people will be receiving this um, webinar. Um, this is a very sad and somber moment for those, uh, for all of us who care about coral reefs. It kind of can feel like your life's work is on the line. Um, and I think it's really important to take a minute and just um, think about that and, and really spend some time considering all the creatures and critters that live on these reefs and how, how much is really being lost. Um, however, there's still a lot of coral diversity out on the reef and our job is to save that. It's not gonna be easy when the world seems to be on fire, but the intelligence, strength, kindness, and solidarity of, the, solidarity of this community gives me a lot of hope. This webinar came together in about a week's time. Um, people have, um, granddaughters being born yesterday that are on the line. Congratulations, Steve. Um, people are awake um, at 3 a.m. for this, and it just shows how um, how committed folks are and, and how much we care about this ecosystem that really is um, on the line. So logistically, we will be sending out the recording just as soon as we um, close out here. Um, within a day or so. And then beyond that, we will um, compile questions and um, get answers to as many of them as we can. Michelle's been telling me that there's a lot of good, big and complicated questions coming in while I've been um, monitoring the presentation. So again, if you have to leave, 
please do. And thank you again for attending. And we have a few minutes to um, uh, have some questions. So Michelle, if you have a couple of those queued up, we can just move right on to that. Definitely. Um, so this first question um, is, this was from earlier in the webinar. Um, the question is, how can less resourced places preserve genetic diversity from their own nurseries in land-based settings in case of an emergency? What are the minimum resources necessary? Michelle, was that a question for me, maybe, or for Ileana? I think I missed um, I think it actually came in during Jessica's presentation, and I think Jen probably had to jump off. Um, but I think, you know, like, Jess, maybe you could just speak to just, you know, from what you guys know, recognizing that we don't have any Aquarius on the panel, <laughs> that um, all of these practitioners are um, field-based. Um, but, you know, Jess, maybe you could just speak to a couple yeah. things. Um, yep. Minimum okay. qualification, make friends with an Aquarist. Uh, they are brilliant people <laughs> um, and extremely helpful. Yeah, it is one of the challenges and it was one of the challenges with the resource limiting thing, which I kind of recognize as I was going through what we did with the Coral Bus. Um, in the past, we have done very basic stuff like holding in, um, bins of seawater shaded with frozen water bottles on it to keep temperatures cool. Um, working with like your traditional like cooler esky helps. Um, one of the interesting collaborations that came through for us in the Keys was actually um, the Key Largo Fisheries offered one of their climate controlled trucks. So if you if you are in a resource limited place, but maybe there's a restaurant or some kind of industry that moves fish around uh, even for consumption they let they let us borrow their climate controlled truck a couple of times um, and that's not because there's anything wrong with the coral bus it's because we're operating in multiple locations and we only have one transport system right now um, but there's a lot working with Aquarius has been really key um, there's a lot of information coming out of Florida lately for <clears throat> recommendations on how to hold corals. Um, a lot of it is also developed from the rescue effort um, through stone and coral tissue loss. So what we can pr probably do is send some of those resources along when we send out um, this recording and answers to these questions as well. So I, <clears throat> one other thought here, it, it's not necessarily land-based, but I think we didn't talk a lot about it here, but it, you know, if places are significantly concerned about the temperature or the light associated with these, moving to deep water can be an easy, simple, cheap solution, right? For the short term, it's not a long-term solution, but that and and potentially doing that over a couple different places. So breaking up your fragments, moving them to a couple locations, getting them deeper and in less light, um, it may or may not work but it's better than doing nothing. And it's probably better than trying to rig your own homemade aquarium um, in the matter of a week or two. Thanks, Tom. I think, uh, oh, go ahead, David. Um, so Alex here, sorry. Just with uh, moving oh, some coral deeper, um, there was a project in the Maldives during the 2016 bleaching event and for some strange reason, the Postulopora seemed to do better in the hotter, shallower water than what they did when we moved them deeper. But the Acropora has definitely benefited from moving deeper. So it could be good to kind of go a percentage, move like 90% of what you're planning on moving and, and monitor and actually see how these different species tolerate these different conditions. Thank you. Um, so we have a follow up question that sort of pairs well um, with this, um, with what Tom was suggesting about moving deeper. The question is, has anyone moved nursery significantly deeper or has experience with it, um, for example, from 25 to 70 feet? It's 
So I think like- I'm um, pretty sure that's, uh, uh, some of the keys may know, but I'm pretty sure Reef Renewal have been, has been taking some of their nurseries down that deep as part of their relocation right now. Yeah, they, yeah. So Reef Renewal is moving some of their verns deep. Um, at 60 feet right now, the temperature is the same as what it is at 20. Um, so there's, I think the, the the benefit would be that it would cool down quicker than what we're gonna experience closer to in shallower waters. And, le um, and less light, a lot less yeah, light. and less light. But there's, so, you know, you're balancing, you're balancing the time it takes to establish this, the time it takes to move and set up a new nursery with everything else. And that's what I was kind of trying to get at is it's just, it's it's a decision-making process and you can change your mind halfway through. Um, and then to Alex's point is I also think it's really important to try multiple different strategies um, and not put all your eggs in one basket over another. For, for areas like Belize, where they have a very broad um, thermal gradient, you have the near shore reefs and you have the offshore reefs, and there's a big difference in temperature, I would basically ignore the cool water adapted corals. They're going to, where are they going to go? Unless you can make them, I would, I, if I had little resources, I'd be focusing on all the near shore corals, bringing them out. To cooler water if you have that option and you know we we don't even use scuba diving in any, any of our sites we don't use any um <clears throat> we never use scuba we don't have the resources but we move we constantly whenever we find a oh this is really in a this species is very unusually in a very unusual warm area we always move some of it out to cooler waters and so it's basically our operational We've stopped restoring. We've stopped doing focusing on outplanting for the last since um, all the way since 2019. We stopped focusing on outplanting, and we started focusing on rescuing everything from the near shore and bringing it out to cooler waters. And we do outplant because we have to. We we have too much growing in the nurseries, but every time we so we have the middle water nurseries that are warm. And we're always moving everything out planting is going into the cooler nursery cooler areas so there are a lot of places that don't have that option but but people need to look at not just what's happening but where are your cool pockets do you have any areas that don't get as hot now during this stress time and even if it doesn't have corals there now maybe it's sand dominated or whatever is it possible to establish coral populations in those cooler areas that that for some reason um, don't 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 get over the threshold of those most heat resistant corals because we're going to have to sacrifice something and I mean you we, I mean unless you want to start translocating to the northern part of Florida or something where it doesn't get too you know but does it get too cold in the winter so is there any place I mean what about Bermuda I don't know I mean what about Bermuda yeah they don't have a cropper is there but I mean, they did, did they historically? I don't know. We have to start thinking out of the box and thinking, how are we going to keep these species alive for the next 50 years? Okay. And so we really have to start trying to imagine we can deal with this year. Great. But if we can't come up with some solutions for long term sustainability, we're wasting time. I mean, it's going to fail. Okay, thank you. Um, any follow-up comments? We'll move on to the next question. So this question is about shading. Um, what is the maximum percent shading that can be used without negatively affecting the corals in zooxanthellae? Would applying UV and blue light blocking yellow filters have a beneficial effect or too negatively impact photosynthesis? I think that would be a question for Neil, who's left. Put Neil's name next to it then. <laughs> um, a 
Okay, so actually, David, we have a question for you. Um, how long does the fog last before it dissipates? Is contact is constant fogging necessary to somewhat lower the temperature or light over a period of time? Yeah, so you've got to run the fogging unit for the period of the day. So the effect only lasts, you know, a matter of um oh, well it's more it's 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 longer than minutes, but but these these machines, I guess, are designed to run for the period that you're fogging, and so you know it dissipates the further away you get from the fogging machine. So, so there's some design that's required to identify the sort of predominant sighting of a machine or machines, and and then um, um you know like I said, some in most of the locations we're looking at, we're assuming that we put a fog machine on something, and you've got a person who's who's running it that day. Um, what we've been trying to test, of course, is whether or not you need to fog all of the time. And our conclusion is you don't. You need to fog during those peak that peak pet temperature period of the day, and then you can shut it down. But um, this kind of relates back to the the numbers that um, others have been talking about, and Neil talked about, and that is the level of light reduction you need. So if if you're already experiencing, because it's not cooling the water in any way, it's simply reducing light. And so if if you've already got elevated temperatures before you start, then you're going to need to fog at a higher density and there's some kind of thresholds we don't we can't really get it much above that sort of thirty percent line. Um, and so so it is a method that that we think if you're going to use it, you would need to do it before it starts warming up too much and run it through that cycle. So. David, how big of a swath area did you guys find was being covered by the fog machines? Obviously, it's weather dependent, but just curious if you have a, a sense. Um, so certainly, I think a fogging machine, Tom, will do a sort of a you know few hundred meter square sites. Um, but but you're right, it's it is incredibly specific to wind conditions and a, and a few other factors and how much you're willing to move it around and all those types of things. Those are the sort of studies that are happening now, now that we've got fogging machines working better um, than the more recent trials and model studies are trying to determine sort of practical um, application rule sets, which we don't quite have yet. Um, you know, I mean, we're asking ourselves the very same questions that the Northern Hemisphere is if this bleaching cycle keeps going and heads down to the GBR, would we try and do a, you know, use that as a method to try and protect some of the sort of really high value sites on the GBR this year? Not sure at this point in time, I have to say, even with the amount of lead time that we might have, um, we're still we just started thinking about that, Tom. Yeah, understood. I think I, I'll re-emphasize a point that Neil made earlier though, and that was shade early um, and shade before you think you have a problem. For those that don't have problems yet, um, at least for your nursery stock, you put a lot of work into that work. Um, I think it's most places on that outlook should probably be given it serious consideration. So okay. some of the nurseries lend themselves to shading more easily. And so we just happen to have a nursery that is very easy to shade. Uh, we just produced a video on how to make those nurseries. If anybody's interested, send me a little message. And I can see you, we don't want to release the videos to the general public on YouTube, um, but we, we wh whoever wants them, we're going to, you know, we just want people that are actually are trustworthy to, to learn how to make the nurseries. And so it could be that we could have our shade cloth already and every year, I mean, if even if we have bleaching problems a couple of months every year, we could put our shade cloth year after year and protect our gene bank in particular. So if, yeah, we have mortality out in the outplaying sites. and if you're locating where there's some current, um, we we see a, a, a big difference in bleaching mortality. If you have some current, even if it's if it's dead water, it, you get higher mortality than if even if it's a gentle current. It's just they just do better. So, uh, little sweet spots of nurseries, you know, locating them. But if anybody wants to know how to make the the, the kind of nurseries that we do, we have some materials now we can share. Yeah, and can I just put on, there was, uh, Austin was talking a bit about it. Um, 
if you've got the resources, I would definitely be trying to do as much temperature monitoring as you can and things like that to try and identify, you know, microrefugia type arrangements. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do that across the GBR to identify the, the locations that might have the, the highest natural ability to survive. So where we see cold water upwelling um, and other things that will simply, they might be the sites that we have to triage back to the locations of the system that you have to triage back to might have no other choice and use, throw all our efforts into keeping corals going there over the next 20 years. I, I, I tend to agree that everywhere we need to be looking at that. And those sort of locations can be quite small. Um, they, they could be due to a sort of macro features um, as in Fiji, in the Fijian example there, they, they could be due to other things. But the more you can, and I know I'm probably telling people that, um, I won't use that word, but um, telling people stuff you already know, but but using it to learn, um, using the, the heat wave temperatures to understand where those sites might be, um, is at least one thing you can learn from. Out, out, near the, out near the pass, there's usually some much cooler water near the pass in sheltered in a sheltered location that's considerably mm. cooler than everywhere else in your whole system. So we always try to look for our, you know, we're looking for gene bank nurseries near the main pass that gets some shelter, but it gets that cool water coming in. So they, and you can rep, once you get good at look, oh yeah, this is a good look for other places and you'll find other places that mimic that. But it's important to get the heat adapted corals in those cool pockets because those cool pockets have cool adapted corals. <laughs> they don't have heat adapted corals there. We've got to get, we've got to take the effort to get the heat adapted corals in those cool pockets. Okay, so um, Tally, do you, how many more questions do we want to do? Um, it's up to you if there's any more kind of pointed questions that you think we can answer live. We, um, I, I was going to stay on until um, the top of the hour, but if you feel like um, the rest of the questions require more thought, we can close out. Um, so we could probably do a couple more. So speaking of sort of heat adapted corals, there's a question about the Red Sea, and I don't know if anybody who's currently on would want to take a stab at this, but the question is just um, says that this person just got back from diving in the Red Sea. Are there any studies going on to look at um, the variables there of heating the coral was in great shape? Yeah, so I'll take a shot at this. We have a lot of work actually going on in the Red Sea <clears throat> on this regard. Um, KAUST is, is looking at stuff across the Red Sea in terms of both thermal tolerance and better understanding why the corals do better here. Um, there is some expectation um, based on work over the last decade that would suggest the, the corals here will do better than most um, in, in a high temperature event. That said, um, the temperatures here are also trending above uh, what we would consider to be the our expectations. And so this will really be a, a true test to some of that theory. Um, and, you know, the corals are in excellent places, in excellent shape here, but I think we're um, still taking a very cautious approach to this, even though, you know, some modeled results would maybe suggest that they will do better. Watch this space. Thank you. Um, all right, let me see if I can find one that we can discuss without uh, too much confusion here. Um, so someone's asking, um, if shading a nursery, how, do, how is the growth of the corals and their productivity? Like, do we notice that shading has any sort of effect on the growth of the corals or um, this isn't in the question but by reducing the amount of sunlight is that um, potentially like negatively affecting the corals if you if you leave it on all year <laughs> but we you take it off after the stress is gone 
So right. it, it's not a matter of that letting them grow. It's a matter of keeping them alive. So it, it you know, it's you, you need to remove them when the water cools off. And, you know, and it's pretty cl clear when when they come off. I'll add that I know some people are are looking at even shading just on uh, on days that are not windy and and wavy. So trying to shade larger areas with boat tended um, shades. So at high value reef sites. So trying to get you know some shades on that are much bigger than what we looked at here, but literally only leaving them out for four hours a day on calm days and having them tended the whole time. If you if 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 you don't have resources, use sargassum and put it on ropes and have it on floaters and and have your seaweed mat above the coral. I mean, maybe it's producing oxygen too. You know, maybe it has a higher heat tolerance and it'll give more oxygen. Who knows? Be creative. Tom, speaking of of that sort of shading, daily shading that you were talking about, does any do any of the panelists know of any work like that that has been actually done anywhere? Like large scale shading, I guess you would call it perhaps, versus like an individual structure. We we have under wharfs, under floating platforms here in Fiji, we have some it's shaded because they put a structure a floating platform for the tourists or something and um sometimes we see you know the corals are under there they're adapted lower light but then when it gets hot uh, they they tend to bleach as well because usually those platforms move around but under the wharfs i've been looking under the wharfs during bleaching and i'm hoping to find corals not bleach under the wharfs but it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference um so I mean, is it because they're adapted to the lower light and they have a different sosentality or something? I don't know. But that's a different question, probably. I probably answered it wrongly. It's too early in the morning. <laughs> uh, let me just look in to see if we have any more. Um, so there are some questions about cloud shading or cloud seeding, um, and I, I'm not sure if we have any panelists on currently who could speak to anything about that, but if so, speak up or I'll, I'll find a new, a new question. Well, I may be able to answer it. It depends what it is. Um, they're just asking about the, the use um, of cloud shading or cloud seeding as a method of lowering um, sunlight effect yeah so 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 we are doing quite a bit of work on cloud brightening um and cloud brightening is a method where you reduce the vapor droplet size in clouds so you have a larger number of smaller droplets and so you get more reflectance back right that's why it's called brightening if you were in a plane flying above the cloud it looks brighter however as a method that that doesn't make a, a major change. So it's not the same as shading. So, so you might change the light level coming through by sort of five to 10% maximum. And so as a method, it only works if you're gonna do that over large areas and you get cooling through time. Right? So it's that, or, you, or you're not seeing warming, in fact, is, is true to the measure. And so in something like the Great Barrier Reef, it probably means you need to do it over a quarter to a third as a minimum because you've got a big boundary effect because water moves, um, maybe even half. So it's, and it has to be, it needs quite specific aerosol counts, you know, cloud systems, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think cloud brightening is gonna be a solution for lots of locations, even if we can get it to work and it's got lots of technical challenges. Um, if it works anywhere, it'll actually work on the DBR. It has a whole bunch of things that that make it that way. Um, you need clean air. There's a whole bunch of criteria that just happen to line up on the Great Barrier Reef. So I, I wouldn't be looking at cloud brightening per se at the moment. Um, and, it, and it will need a lot of investment to, to roll it out. Um, cloud seeding. Uh, 
yeah, that's a whole different kettle of fish because there you're looking to do the opposite and that's to increase the droplet size and you're typically looking to make it rain. I haven't heard of anyone studying that as anything to do with coral reefs. So I've, I've literally done the designs and installed that in another life, um, cloud or snow seeding, um, you know, cloud seeding systems. Um, but uh, yeah, you'll have other other implications of doing that about where it might rain and all that sort of stuff that you'd have to consider as well. And I'm not sure what the benefits would be. I suppose maybe some rain falling on the surface might make might cool temperatures down a bit. Um, but again, you need quite specific atmospheric conditions, cloud systems to then seed those clouds with something like silver iodine or whatever your method is to um, induce rain. It would make more sense to reforest some of your deforested islands because you see the cloud that forms over the islands in the afternoon can have a huge effect of cooling the, the local environment. So when you have a deforested island, like lots of Puerto Rico's deforested, if they had more forests, they would have more, those, those clouds would be bigger and, and you would change the climate basically. So, I mean, the long-term solution is to get the forest back on, on these big islands that would then, then in turn help to protect the reefs by cooling off the, especially in the afternoon when the, when the big clouds form every day. So the navigators, you know, when you, when you can't see an island below the horizon, you look for the big white cloud, you know, oh, there's the island under there because of this uh, adiabatic, you know, the heating of the island and then the high humidity and it forms a cloud. And this is a normal thing that forms in the afternoon. And if you have a deforested island, it doesn't do that anymore. So, um, Mother Nature has her own ways. She turns on the fan when she gets too hot, and that's called a hurricane or a cyclone. So you have warm waters, and they're expecting a very active cyclone season, hurricane season. And so seriously, I hope you get some tropical storms really soon. I hope they don't hit and cause too much damage on the reef. But seriously, that is Mother Nature's solution. And so we should all be praying for for some tropical storms to come. And seriously, if we got it. This is, if you look at all those temperature, those um, from the NOAA side, if you look how suddenly it kind of tops out, if you look at the wet, if you look at the background, it's, it's a cyclone that causes those, everything to balance out. So it saved the whole Western part of Fiji this year. We had two big cyclones that were kind of in the middle of nowhere and didn't hit anything, but then they went and hit New Zealand. There were two big floods in New Zealand related, but they saved our reefs in the whole Western part of Fiji. And then we had two cyclones that hit and damaged Vanuatu a lot, and they also cooled it off. So the western part of Fiji escaped one of the biggest bleachings we've ever had, and the eastern part, the further away from the cyclones, they still had a bad problem. So you need your cyclones, so just cheer them on. Cheer on your hurricanes and just hope they don't like, hit the reef or the land and just cool everything off. And that's Mother Nature's way. And the other way, she, the other thing she can do is she can melt ice at the North Pole and she, and seriously, if Amok were to, when it does collapse and it collapsed 13,000 years ago and there's signs that it's very weakened now, that it was the 12,000 year old collapse that prevented massive runaway climate change and it might happen this time. So people are concerned with Amok collapse, I'm cheering it on because that's the only way to prevent massive methane release and runaway climate change. So once, once we get the Arctic to freeze again, then that saves the world. Now, if you look at the models, it also cools off the Caribbean. So, so um, anyway, so we, you know, if an MOX supposed to collapse, 95% chance between, between 2025 and 2095, bring it on sooner and maybe it helps everybody. We, we got to keep the corals alive until humanity gets its act together, lower the carbon, and Mother Nature figures out her, her homeostasis solution uh, to cool off the Caribbean, and she will. So, but we have to keep the corals from going extinct. And that's the challenge now. And it's not restoration anymore. It's every single coral is a in highly endangered species. If you look at a decadal um, vision, we have every species in the Caribbean is, should be considered highly endangered. We have to keep it alive. And we have to look regionally, not just in the US or in um, you know, another country, we have to look regionally keeping the genetic diversity of the entire region high. And if we find an area where it's more likely of surviving and it's not in our own country, but we have to support that because that can then help when everything's coming back again, 
it's going to help to reboot the biodiversity. So we have to have a long-term approach and we have to also have hope in our hearts and we have to know that keeping these species alive, even these things, oh, well, it's only a temporary solution. Well, yeah, we need temporary solutions because the long-term means we have to keep them alive, even if for now it's pretty desperate looking. But I have hope for the future because I know Mother Earth, Mother Nature has her solutions and she's she's working on it. <laughs> Austin, I love that. Make ourselves. <laughs> I love that as a closer, um, from shade cloths to um, shutting down global climate cycling to speeding it up. Um, our job is to keep the corals alive while um, while um, all these things get figured out and while powers that be um, work towards um, reducing greenhouse gases and drawing down carbon and, and all of these things we have our job cut out for us i'm so happy that we had so many people joining we will be sending out the webinar please when the email comes out please respond to the poll questions they should take you about 10 seconds it's just going to be um, our way for the crc to better respond to our community and to learn a little bit about who joined us today um, so thank you all again I'm going to close this out and I can see this type of um, webinar happening more regularly. So please let me know what worked and didn't and um, we'll be in touch. <laughs> bye, bye. Thanks so much, Austin and everyone. Yeah. Thanks to all the panelists. Bye bye. Thank you so much. This was good. <laughs>